on the conflict is the former head of the British Army, General Lord Richard Dannett. Uh, Lord Dannett, we appreciate your time um, so much this morning. Can you just give us um, a snapshot of where we are at the moment? Because some of the images that have been circulating are some of the most disgusting, uh, horrific things I've Sick. ever seen. And that's clearly just a snapshot. Shot. Where is this war heading? Well, I mean, you're quite right, Mercy, to say that some of the pictures that we've seen are, are really quite appalling, disgraceful, and frankly just shouldn't be there in the 21st century, and certainly not in Europe. I mean, as far as the overall situation is concerned, yes, uh, as has been well reported over the last few days, the Russians have significantly withdrawn from the uh, north of Kiev and are pulling back to Belarus. Um, they've taken quite a pounding there, and well done to the Ukrainians who have fought remarkably on that front. Um, just come to the south, uh, as you were reporting just a moment or two ago uh, on your news, the town of Mariupol is still holding out. This is quite extraordinary that um, after 42 days and having been encircled for most of that time, Mariupol is still holding out. Whether it will continue to do so, I think only time will tell. If Mariupol, if Mariupol does fall, then the Russians will have achieved their objective of having a land corridor from Crimea through Mariupol to the Donbass region. And of course, it's in the Donbass region, the two provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk, that we believe, with good intelligence basis, that the Russians will mount their new offensive to try and take those two provinces complete. Um, if you remember, before the war started, uh, Vladimir Putin declared that they were independent. Uh, part of them had been occupied by the Russians since 2014. And certainly it would look as if the minimum Russian objective now in this war is to control Luhansk and Donetsk completely and have that land corridor from Crimea through to the Donbass. They're pretty much giving up in, in the Kyiv area. Yeah, we can talk tactics. I'd like to pick your brains on what you've just said there and delve a bit deeper. But there's something I want to do first with you, if that's all right. So as the former head of the British Army, you know, if you were confronted with a situation whereby, we, well, I mean, it's not impossible to believe we'd invade someone, we did it numerous times, but let's say in Afghanistan, for example, where all of a sudden there's mass graves uncovered and there's mass rape and there's this, that and the other going on, right? And that's been committed by the British Army. Is it possible that that could have happened as the head of the former head of the British Army without your knowing of it, without your say so? My point here being, is that how responsible is Vladimir Putin for the actions of his troops? Well, um, let's put it in the context of Bosnia in the mid 90s. Uh, and I gave evidence against General Vladic and General Kerstic, two senior Serb generals. Uh, at the International Criminal uh, tri Tribunal uh, in The Hague. Now, what was established there is that the massacre of 8,500 Muslim men and boys in Srebrenica in July 1995, the actions of the troops on the ground that did the killing can be traced all the way back to President Karadzic and General Mladic, who were the military and political heads of the Serb part of Bosnia at the time. What's called command responsibility can be traced back from actions on the ground all the way through to the political and military leadership. And it was because we, because it was so well documented and evidence and evidence gathered that Karadzic and Maladic were both brought to trial in The Hague and were properly convicted. So Vladimir Putin and his senior generals want to be absolutely clear that the evidence that's being gathered of what's gone in Bucha and elsewhere in Ukraine one day may well be brought before them at a court of law. Now, it may be impossible to get Putin into a court of law, but the court of history will certainly judge him as being appalling evil and go into the ranks with Hitler and Stalin of the most condemned people in the human race. I think you said, look, that's, that's really fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wondered is, look, finger, fingers crossed this ends at some point, right? If Putin ever travels abroad again, if he ever does a state visit, anywhere else again. Can he be nicked? Of course he can, and I don't think he'll do that. I don't think we'll see Vladimir Putin uh, in public probably ever again. Uh, even, even within Russia, his security will be so tight because although the Kremlin can pretty much control the media and can control the information that goes out to the Russian people, there's sufficient information getting out through social media and through other informal networks that an increasing number of people in Russia know that this is an appalling war 
it's being done apparently in the name of Russia, but they disown that. This is Putin's war, it's the Kremlin's war. He has virtually made himself a prisoner in the Kremlin and in his own uh, other retreats. Um, whatever he's done to other people, he certainly wrecked his own life. And if, if there was ever a question of going on a state visit, um, I don't think he'd get very far. Mm. Yeah, and uh, the Chancellor of Germany, Olaf Schloss, uh, stated that actually the EU would be worse off um, than Russia, basically, if we sort of if we stop the dependence on, or we, the EU, stops the defend, dependent on Russian gas and oil. Clearly, there's a balance <laughs> to be struck here, isn't there? Because lots of people globally are facing an energy crisis, and we have energy insecurity uh, in this country today. How do we balance those diplomatic interests, those military interests, with the interests of people here at home who are struggling to get by and struggling to pay their bills? Well, I'm afraid I would echo what President Zelensky was reported as saying, I think it was in the Irish Parliament uh, earlier on today, and that he said previously, how can you weigh up the appalling loss of life being inflicted on Ukrainian people against the, the comfort and the warmth of other people in Western Europe provided as a result of them enjoying Russian oil and gas. I'm afraid, yes, this is Ukraine's fight. Ukrainian people are, are suffering appallingly, but they are fighting on behalf of the rule of law. They're fighting on behalf of democracy and liberal democracy at that, which is something that we all enjoy. So I'm afraid we're all going to have to learn that we're going to suffer to some extent along with the Ukrainians, not being killed in the street as Ukrainians are, but actually having to accept that energy prices are rocketing up, energy supply will not be as good. And frankly, this is coming home to haunt some governments, in particular the German government, who has depended far too much over the last 10, 15 years on Russian gas and oil. And this is now coming home to roost. It's going to affect all of us. It might be Ukraine's war, but actually we're all going to suffer in this. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us this uh, morning, General Lord Richard Danner. And finally, are you at home by any chance? I, I, I was going to say you have fantastic taste in art. I, can, uh, I was admiring uh, your background there. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not actually. I'm in a friend's, the boardroom of a friend's company, where I nipped okay. in to do this broadcast for you before I go off elsewhere. Oh, okay. good stuff. Well, it must be a very successful company, but thank you very much for joining us. I really do appreciate it. Take care. I'll have to speak to you very soon.